Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. Uh, welcome to CBM's first professional education event of 2021. Uh, today's session is entitled Maximizing Your Social Security Benefits and Avoiding Mistakes. Uh, this one hour session is going to be hosted by Judy Barnhard and Alex Seleznev. Uh, Alex is a senior advisor and portfolio strategist at CBM, and he's the firm's financial advisor and of the firm's financial advisory subsidiary MBI. Uh, he's a certified financial planner and a chartered financial analyst who leads the firm's investment management division. Uh, his focus is on comprehensive financial planning and investment management. Uh, he's also a regular co-presenter at the firm's market update sessions, which are held every other month. Uh, the next session is scheduled for Wednesday, February 3rd, and a little bit later on in the session, we'll have a slide of upcoming events, uh, giving you access to register for uh, uh, the February 3rd event. Uh, Judy Barnhart is a senior vice president at CBM, uh, co-chair of the firm's financial planning practice and committee chair for the firm's professional services practice. Uh, she's a senior advisor at MBI and the chief compliance officer. In her role as a CPA and certified financial planner, uh, Judy consults on income tax preparation and planning, retirement planning, cash flow and budgeting, risk management and estate planning. Again, we welcome you to today's session uh, please keep your video off as a courtesy to our presenters today. Uh, thank you for those who submitted questions during the registration process. Uh, they have been sent to our speakers and have been incorporated into the presentation today. Uh, if you do have questions at all during the session, uh, please use the chat box. Uh, the presenters will focus on the content of the presentation and respond to questions a little bit later on in the hour. Uh, if we don't get to your question for some reason, however, uh, please feel free to reach out to our presenters after the session. Uh, today's session is being recorded and presentation slides will be sent to the attendees a little bit later on today or early tomorrow. Uh, if you are participating in this meeting on your phone, uh, please do email your name and email address to either Austin or myself. Uh, Austin sent you the meeting access link. Uh, thanks, and again, I'm going to turn it right now over to Judy and Alex. Uh, Judy, I think you need to unmute yourself. Thank you about that. Sorry about that. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us for this presentation. We had over 250 registrants, so we're very excited that this is such a popular topic for everybody and we received 30 questions in advance. We will be incorporating your questions into the material that we are presenting. We also have some slides of, of questions at the end. And as um, Joe just mentioned, feel free to add to the chat box. We have left some time, uh, hopefully 10, 15 minutes at the end to cover people's questions. So very excited to have you with us. Okay. Just a little history on uh, the Social Security system. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but um, I did want to let you know that Social Security was actually signed into law by President Roosevelt in 1935. And uh, it's a bit ironic that in 2035, some 100 years later, uh, the surplus in the uh, Social Security fund is scheduled to basically be depleted. Um, I'll be talking about that in the next slide, but that is the, kind of the history that we, we have. Medicare was um, passed in 1965. Survivor and spousal benefits were added in 1939. And then, of course, the big change in 1984 was that federal workers, all new federal workers, were going to be covered under Social Security, and old workers could either choose between staying with the civil service retirement system or moving on to the Social Security system. So what is the health of the Social Security um, Trust Fund? The OASI, which is the Old Age Survivors Insurance Trust Fund, um, is what disperses retirement, disability, and Social Security benefits. And it had, as of the end of 2019, $2.9 trillion in reserves. This is based on a 2020 annual report that the Social Security Board of Trustees has prepared. However, you'll see the benefit payments going out are now increasingly outstripping the income that is earned into the fund. Hence, the surplus in the trust is scheduled to be depleted, estimated to be depleted by 2035. The system will exhaust its cash reserves and the continuing tax income will be sufficient to pay only 79% of scheduled benefits. That's what 
that is what's being anticipated. And that would last for some 75 years. So Social Security won't die. It's not dead. Um, it does need to be fixed. What's causing this is, of course, the baby boomers, um, those born between 1946 and 1964 are retiring. Uh, population is aging. A big factor is the birth rates have dropped in the United States. Um, so, you know, Congress is going to have to make changes. Uh, the program is very popular, as everybody knows. Um, both parties, um, the Republicans and the Democrats, nobody really wants to touch it because it's one of those things that uh, is very unpopular when you talk about changing it. But nonetheless, it is going to have to be addressed. And some of the ways that we've heard, um, of course, is to delay the benefit age for younger people coming into the Social Security system, perhaps to age 68. Um, to increase the payroll taxes that uh, are received into the system, either by raising the, the threshold, which has been raised, being raised every year, raising the tax rate, possibly taxing all wages, um, and of course, mean testing. Now, mean testing is um, <laughs> for those that feel like they've you know, worked the last 35, 40 years of their lives and are being told that perhaps um, their benefit will be reduced or eliminated because they have sufficient means is uh, is one way to do it, but it's I think it's going to be um, an uphill battle. They're talking about perhaps two hundred fifty thousand dollars as the means threshold, but those are ways that perhaps the Social Security system might be able to be shored up. Okay, I'm going to be talking about the basics of Social Security. Alex is then going to be talking about creative ways to decide what is break even, what what uh, planning techniques that you should use. But first, before we go into those strategies, let's talk about some of the basics. Um, how do you qualify? So in order to qualify, you have to have 40 Social Security credits. You earn a credit um, by paying Social Security tax on your income. So it has to be earned income. Um, you can get four credits per year, meaning that it takes 10 years to basically qualify for Social Security. Uh, in 2021, $1,470 in earnings equals one credit. And you must be generally over age 62 or over or disabled in order to qualify for Social Security. What about um, spouses? So the spousal benefit can begin at age 62, as long as the spouse is claiming Social Security benefits. And the spousal benefit can be as much as 50% of the working spouse's full retirement age benefit. How is Social Security benefit calculated? Well, the benefit is based on what's called average indexed monthly earnings. And the average summarizes up to 35 years of a worker's indexed earnings. If you work more than 35 years, they throw out the, uh, the, the lower year's earnings. And if you work less than 35 years, uh, they attribute zero earnings to those years. Uh, to give you an idea, if you were to receive $2,000 a month in Social Security benefits, a worker would need to have inflation adjusted annual earnings of approximately $60,000 for 35 years. Um, strongly recommend that you go to Social Security online you can create a what's called a My Social Security account, and you can check for completeness. This is very important. Make sure that the lifetime earnings that are there are complete. And if not, bring it to the attention of Social Security Administration right away. You certainly want to be credited for all of the uh, work that you have, in fact, um, earned. And uh, on that site, you will also be able to find out what your benefits are at age 62, at your full retirement age, uh, and uh, at age 70. So definitely put that on your to-do list for 2021 um, as a New Year's resolution. Okay, what is full retirement age? Um, well, it depends on the date that you're born. Um, you can be, you become eligible to collect at age 62. Full retirement uh, is generally 66 in two months right now. It's gradually it gradually increasing to age 67 for people born in 1960 or later. You can further increase your benefit by delaying to age 70, which we will be going over. How do you determine what the monthly benefit is? Uh, in the case of early retirement, age 62, the benefit is reduced by 
roughly 60 cents annually for each year you draw early, early from your normal retirement date. Um, note also, it reduces anyone who can draw on your account. So you, that comes into play as to who might be able to draw on your account. And a credit is given of 8% per year for delayed retirement after full retirement age. No credit is given after age 69. So caution, it's a forever penalty or forever bonus. And for people that are thinking, gee, could I make 8% in the stock market guaranteed for three years by delaying your retirement age? Mm, maybe not. So that's really something to, to take into account. Will Social Security benefits change once received? Well, Social Security benefits are increased annually, and it's based on the Department of Labor's Consumer Price Index. For 2021, Social Security recipients received an increase of 1.3%. Will Social Security benefits be taxed? <laughs> this is always a good question. Um, if your total income is more than $25,000 single or $32,000 married filing joint, your Social Security benefits are subject to tax. The portion that's subject depends on how much your income level is, and the maximum could be that 85% of your total Social Security benefits will be subject to federal tax. I do say federal because state tax is different. Many states don't tax Social Security benefits. Some states don't have income tax at all. So that's something to keep in mind when you are uh, deciding where you're planning on, on retiring and um, the effect that the tax will be on your Social Security check. What about Medicare? So Medicare, as we all know, is the country's health insurance program for people age 65 or older. The initial enrollment period begins three months before your 65th birthday and ends three months after your 65th birthday. Uh, enrollment in Medicare and Social Security do not need to be made at the same time. So the message here is don't miss that enrollment. There are penalties if you don't enroll in Medicare within that window, that six month window of turning age 65. But the decision to decide when to start drawing on Social Security is different. That could be made at 62, can be made at full retirement age, can be age 70. So just keep that in mind. Uh, we are going to be having a separate Medicare and Medicaid uh, planning seminar. We're going to offer that on February 23rd. It's a whole separate hour just talking about Medicare. So we won't be touching base um, on that anymore in this presentation. Uh, what should you consider before applying for benefits? Well, financial need, of course. Um, do recommend that you prepare a budget and a budget for retirement. Now, many financial planners will tell you that you know, you might, your budget might be 70% or so of what your current budget is, but everybody has a unique situation. Um, you have to consider where you're gonna be living. Are you gonna be living in a no tax state? Are you going to be living overseas? Are you going to be living in a very, uh, a state with very low living costs? Um, and consider also other sources of income, right? Many, many people in this area have federal pensions, uh, annuities, or other sources of, of income, and that will help decide as to when you do want to apply for Social Security benefits. Um, life expectancy currently is estimated at 84 for men and 87 for women, something to keep in mind. Um, health condition, so diabetes, smoking, obesity, uh, these are called chronic conditions. And I read an NIH article that said that uh, if you have one or multiple of these chronic conditions, your life expectancy could decrease by eight to 18 years. So if you take that 84 for men and you take off 18 years, you know, what does that tell you? That's, that's a very short life expectancy in terms of when you're gonna be drawing social security benefits. Um, genetic history. So do you have a predisposition to certain illnesses? When did your parents die or are they still alive? Or if they did die, did they die? Were they smokers? And maybe you're not a smoker. So, you know, take that into um, consideration. Advantages of delaying claiming. Um, you know, will the higher uh, monthly benefit by waiting until age 70 uh, impact your decision? 
Options to claim spousal benefits. Consider, again, the age difference between the spouses um, and long-term care needs. Um, one fun fact, one in four 65-year-olds today will live to age 90, and one in 10 65 years year olds will live to age 95. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Alex, and he's going to be doing uh, some planning with you. Sounds good. Well, thank you. Thank you, Judy, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. So before we dive into different planning considerations, I just wanted to share a couple of tables with you. So on the top of this slide, you see the Social Security Life Expectancy Table. Uh, there are, by the way, different versions of it, meaning in terms of the um, life expectancy tables, depending on what agency um, that you're working with, but this one is for Social Security. So if you're a 55-year-old male, you're expected to live to age 83. If you're a 75-year-old female, you're expected to live to age 89. And one of the things that perhaps you already noticed on this, um, on this chart is that essentially the older you are, the longer you're expected to live. And that's not a mistake. That is how um, it actually works, statistically speaking. Now, this is how Social Security thinks about it. When we do planning for our clients, for both you know, retirement and um, Social Security planning purposes, we normally assume that they will be in retirement to age 95. But as Judy mentioned just a moment ago, um, quite frequently would actually adjust it down depending on the actual circumstances of this particular client or, um, or couple. Now, in terms of your full retirement age, I suggest that you simply memorize this date. Again, Judy talked about this briefly uh, a moment ago. Essentially, if you were born in 1960 or, or later, um, it would be 67. So your FRA is 67. Um, and for those of you between the age of 19, uh, between the, that were born between 1937 and 1959, it's essentially between 65 um, and 66 and 10 months. But really for most people, or um, you know, considering or haven't applied for Social Security yet, it would be between 62 and 67. I'm, I'm sorry, 66 and, and um, 67. So when, when should you be applying for your benefits? Um, as long as you qualify and as long as you're not disabled, you can apply for your benefits anytime between your age 62 and 70. And what's important here is that it's any time. Uh, in our webinar today, and usually when we talk with clients, we would focus on this three thresholds, you know, 62, 67, and 70. But in practice, it can be 63 and five months. It can be 68 and nine months. That is perfectly fine. We'll talk about, you know, pros and cons of taking that direction. Again, it's any time between 62 and 70. Age 62 is the earliest age that you can collect your benefits, and that's when you'd receive the smallest possible benefit. Um, it would be, depending again on your actual FRA or full retirement age, it can be reduced by up to 30%, again, compared to your full retirement age benefit. Once you reach your full retirement age, um, you can consider delaying your benefits. For each year that you're delaying, your benefits would increase by 8%, flat. So if it's a partial year, it would be a partial um, increase. Now, one of the top, I would say, three questions, and we received multiple questions for this webinar, very similar here. Uh, can I work and collect my social security benefits at the same time? Well, presumably already reach your 62nd birthday. Well, the answer is yes, but there is an earnings test. Uh, and when it's applied, that may actually result in significant reduction or you know, effectively elimination of your benefit. So if, if you're going to reach your FRA, let's say you're 63 years old, um, you know, it, after 2021, the reduction in your social security benefit would be $1 for every $2 in earned income in excess of 18,960,000 dollars per year. If you're actually going to reach your FRA in 2021, the reduction is $1 for every $3 um, in earned income in excess of 50520 So to keep it simple, there's really no need for you to memorize this and this change every year. If you are working and you're earning more than, let's say, $50,000 or perhaps even less than that, it is unlikely that you should be collecting your benefits. 
Simply put, you're not going to be receiving much because of the earnings test. Your actual benefit will continue to increase. So at your full retirement age, you'll receive a larger amount. But up until this point, up until that point, it simply doesn't make much sense to uh, apply for your benefits. Next slide, please. All right, so this is, we, we, we had, I wanna say four, maybe five questions on this um, you know, submitted for this webinar. What is the break even point? All right, so one thing before we dive into this, this is directly from the social security website. And I think this is a very good representation, but it's a generic representation, meaning it does not account for your specific circumstances and it does not account for your tax circumstances to be specific. So taxes are not included in this calculation. So if you're trying to compare, you know, should you begin collecting at 60, 62 versus 66? And we work on the assumption that you will receive the maximum possible benefit for both of those ages. So if you believe that you're going to live beyond age 76, it is better for you to begin collecting your benefits at the age of 66, which is the FRA in this case, versus age 62. Now, if we're trying to compare 62 and 70, right? If you believe that you're going to live beyond age 79, it is better for you to collect at the age of 70 versus 62. Now, I'll tell you in practice, it is very rare that we would compare those two options. It's just very rare when someone would say, should I take at 62 or at age 70? Because it's a very large, it's a very long period of time to make that decision. The third example here is something that we would normally focus on. And I'll talk about that in more detail in just a moment. You know, should you collect at your full retirement age or should you delay to age 70? So the break-even point for that decision is age 82. So again, if you believe that you are going to live beyond age 82, you should consider collecting at the age of 70 versus your full retirement age. Next slide, please. All right, so talking about strategy here, or different considerations um, when you're trying to make your decision in terms of when you should be collecting your benefits. So again, age 62 is the earliest, assuming you're not disabled, and the maximum benefit that you would receive at this age in 2021 happens to be $2,324 per month. Why would you want to? Why would you want to go this route? Well, perhaps you have some immediate cash needs. You're no longer working. You don't necessarily plan to return back to work. You do not necessarily want to deplete your bank, you know, investment or retirement account, or perhaps you have limited resources. Um, and you just say, why, why would I, um, you know, um, why would I draw from my own, my own funds? Perhaps it's better for me to collect um, my social security benefits. Now, when it really works, quote unquote, well, when we would really suggest that um, this approach is when we have a conversation, someone tells us, well, you know what? I do have a relatively short life expectancy. Or as Judy mentioned earlier, perhaps it's someone with a chronic condition. And from that perspective, well, why take any risks from that perspective? Perhaps you should just start collecting um, your benefits sooner. In terms of your full retirement age or FRA, again, between 66 and 67, for most people, the maximum benefit in 2021 is $3,113 per month. Interesting, from our perspective, when we work with our clients, that happens to be the most optimal for you know, most of our clients, I would say two out of three. And we would normally, you know, um, create our benchmark projection based on this assumption. What happens if you begin collecting at your FRA, but then would look at different options in terms of improving the outcome. Um, now, one of the main reasons why we would start at that point is there's no longer any penalty for earned income. So when people you know, plan for their retirement, they're, let's say they're working full time, and then at some point they want to scale down you know, to work in part time, this is a very good approach. Again, there's no penalty for any earned income once you reach your full retirement age. From the life expectancy perspective, we don't have to take, we don't have to make any guesses. Ah. This approach assumes that you're essentially, um, you know, have average life expectancy. Now, late commencement or age 70. Again, doesn't have to be 70, it can be 69, but at the age of um, 70 in 2021, the, the maximum benefit you would receive is 3,000. 
895 uh, per month. And it's interesting, this is what the fourth year we're doing is, and it's getting closer and closer to you know $4,000. So this is the highest benefit you'd receive. Um, it would just adjust by, uh, by inflation each year. Now, what Judy was referring to earlier, I just want to really, you know, comment on that. So for many of our clients, their portfolios become more and more conservative as they age or as they each reach their retirement years. So if your portfolio is mostly in bonds and in, in the long run, you're expected to earn somewhere between three to 4% from your portfolio or perhaps even less. Now, if you delay your benefits for each year that you're waiting, you're essentially automatically re receiving this increase of 8%. So from this investment perspective, perhaps you're better off again, uh, taking, taking funds out of your portfolio and letting your social security essentially grow at 8% per year. Now, if you have other sources of income, this one is pretty straightforward. Um, if you have pension, you know, a good quarter of our clients are either former or current government employees, you know, given our location in Bethesda. So if you, let's say you're already in retirement and you have your pension that covers, let's say three quarters of your income, well, perhaps again, for the same reason, as I mentioned earlier, you're better off delaying so that the benefit is larger as you wait, or perhaps you continue to work. Now for this scenario, we almost always have to assume, we shouldn't say always, but frequently, that your life expectancy is above average in order for this to work. Now, one thing that you do not see on this slide, but I like to mention this, especially when we have our meetings, when you decide to delay from 67, let's say to age 70, what you're essentially doing is you're gambling. You're gambling on your own life expectancy. What is the price of this gamble? the price of this gamble happens to be close to $100,000. Why am I saying that? Because if you're at the, at the max, right, by waiting for 36 months, you're essentially not collecting $102,000. So of course, if you live into your mid 80s, you know, mid 90s or maybe beyond, you're going to win in this gamble, but that's one way of thinking about it. You are leaving a pretty significant chunk on the table when you're deciding to a spoon. Next slide, please. So this is one of those things we normally cover as part of our holistic approach. We'll certainly not talk about that in much detail today, but you now consider your long-term care needs when you're making your social security decisions. So according to a study uh, by MetLife, the best age to apply for long-term care insurance is between 48 and 54. For those who are, you know, 65 or older, it frequently becomes, you know, cost prohibitive. And what I mean by saying that, for a decent policy, you're looking at five, six, sometimes seven hundred dollars per month. It can be significantly more expensive than that. Plus, as some or perhaps many of you know, um, long-term care premiums tend to go up quite significantly each year. So one strategy, and I understand this is a relatively simplistic example, is to delay your social security benefits. So by delaying from 67 to 70, um, and assuming you're at the max, you're, you're at the max benefit, you would be receiving $800, almost $800 per month for life at your age 70, adjusted for inflation. Now, in addition to that, at least you know, conceptually speaking, when you're not making those premium payments, and again, those premium payments are expected to go up each year, presumably you now have this option to invest the funds, right? And you're, if you invest in, let's say, $500 per month or 6,000 per year for 10 years at a modest rate of 5%, you're looking at 77,000 you know, in 10 years. If it's for 20 years, let's say from 65 to 85, something like 206, thousand right so when you take this two into consideration higher benefit plus additional savings well will this necessarily you know solve your long-term care problem well probably not you probably look, need to look into this more but at least it would help um, with that decision next slide please all right so this is this is actually one of my favorite discussion points when we work with couples um, and we're discussing you know, when exactly when they should be collecting um, their benefits. So we'll, we'll discuss two you know, 
examples here, very specific examples. If you, you know, do not fully understand or you just forget, please remember this. If you are married and there is a significant difference in age between you and your spouse, very frequently collecting your benefits at the, at the same age is not a very good idea. Not always, but very frequently, it's not a very good idea from the perspective of maximizing your lifetime benefits. So here's our first example here. And again, this is for illustration purposes only. We're assuming that each spouse would receive the maximum possible benefit for each age. There is no inflation adjustment. We wanted to keep it um, straight that way. And no taxes were included here. And because the, the, those variables would, of course, impact the outcome. So our husband here is 67 years old, and his life expectancy is 85 average. Our wife here is 60 years old, so she's 77 years younger than him, and her life expectancy is also average, which is 89. So in, in this example, the wife is um, expected to outlive her husband by 10 years. If both of them collect their benefits at the age of 67, meaning the husband begins immediately, he is already 67, and the wife begins in seven years, the combined present value of their benefits, lifetime benefits, is 1,389,000. Okay, so that's the starting point. Now, can we do better than that? What if the wife begins to collect at the age of 62, two years from now, it's gonna be a smaller amount, and then the husband begins immediately at the age of 67. The present value of this option is 1,443,000. That's an improvement of $54,000. Why is this the case? Well, first of all, the wife is now collecting for essentially five more years. So she's not waiting to age 67. So it's a smaller benefit, but for five years. Plus, which is very important, the wife would inherit her husband's benefit. And in our case, we're assuming that he is going to predecease her. If you're married and your spouse dies, you would either continue with your own benefit or you would inherit your spouse's benefit if it's larger because you, you will never be able to collect both benefits at the same time. So that's why this you know, hedging is how, I keep, is how I refer to to it works. Now in scenario C, um, wife collects at the age of 62, the husband decides to postpone to age 70. This creates the largest benefit for this particular couple. It gives the, the combined present value is 1,563,000, which is an improvement of 174,000 compared to scenario A. So in this case, by the way, I'm inclined to say this is a pretty straightforward calculation. Next, please. So example two may appear to be, you know, simple, but it's, it's actually not such a simple example. So we have our husband and wife. They're of exactly the same age here. They are age 67. And the wife, just like in the previous example, is expected to outlive her husband by 10 years. If both collect at the age of 67, collect at the same age, um, the benefit, the lifetime benefit in this example is 1,588,000. If the wife collects immediately and the husband waits for three years, the combined benefit, as you would expect, larger for the same reasons that I discussed earlier. It's now 1,850, pretty significant increase. In scenario C, both of them are waiting to age 70, so three years each, and the combined value is now 1,945. So if you just look at the numbers, it really looks like scenario C is better than scenario B. But is that truly the case? Scenario C is better than scenario B from the present value perspective because we're discounting all of those numbers to today by $95,000. Not bad, right? However, in the first three years that the wife is not collecting her benefits, she's essentially leaving close to $100,000 on the table. So it's a, it still perhaps works in the long run, but it, it's a relatively expensive way of doing this. So when we're comparing these three options, well, perhaps for this couple, option B is the most optimal choice. Now, again, the bottom line is if there's a difference in age and you're married, consider reviewing your claiming strategy. And of course, your personal circumstances must always be considered. Judy. Thank you, Alex. 
So for those of you that are online, um, you see that we um, regularly, we work with many uh, financial planning clients, um, many people that are considering retirement, and uh, we run these different scenarios for them um, and help them then, you know, determine what the right benefit is for them. Um, so happy to do that if you have any questions. Um, Alex is a pro at putting those, uh, those projections together. Uh, so we also you, wanted to, <laughs> wanted to <laughs> cover um, the restricted application claiming strategy. We did get some questions um, for this uh, seminar in advance. Um, the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015 actually eliminated what's called the file and suspend rule, which many people still think that maybe that exists, but unfortunately that's, that's now uh, you know, six years uh, old. Um, but there is a carve out if you were lucky enough to be born before January 2nd of 1954. That would put you at roughly age 66 in uh, 2021. Um, and it is a way to increase the social security benefits for married couples. Uh, specifically, you have to meet the age requirement, you must be married. The lower earning spouse applies for the benefit uh, and applies, must start the process by applying first. The higher earning spouse applies for a restricted application on spousal benefits. When the higher earner reaches age 70, he switches to their own benefit, which is then grown, as we showed you, by 8% since their full retirement age. Um, and essentially what the strategy does is it lets the beneficiary restrict an application for spousal benefits only, giving the beneficiary Social Security now while allowing his or her own um, benefit to grow 8% to age 70. So if this applies to you, wanted to let you know um, more and more, there's a shrinking group that it does apply to, but we did want to cover it. Now, uh, what if you're divorced? Ex-spouses do catch a break. Um, if a couple has been divorced two or more years, the ex-spouses are considered to be independently entitled to Social Security benefits. And as long as a couple was married at least 10 years, the ex-spouse who is still single, and that's very important, must be single, can file a restricted application for spousal benefits. Um, and it, it doesn't matter whether or not their ex is claiming the benefit or not. So for those um, spouses, that have gone through a divorce, perhaps they spent many of their years um, being a, uh, a housewife or house husband, um, and their own benefit is actually fairly small. They can file based on their spouse's benefit if they meet the 10 year rule, and they would be able to get the larger benefit. Um, in terms of being a widower, so there's a difference between divorce benefits and being um, a, a widow. Um, the rules if you're widowed is that the, you must have been married to the deceased for at least nine months and you can actually start, uh, you must be age 60 or 50 is disabled, right? Um, and in most cases, survivor benefit is based on the benefit amount of the late spouse. Um, how much you receive is really gonna be based on when you claim uh, less if it's age, age 60, more obviously if you wait until the full retirement age or to age 70. Uh, if you qualify for retirement benefits on your own record, you could um, start with filing at age 60 and then switch to age 62 and get your own benefits. So something to keep in mind, special rules uh, if you are a widower. And uh, remarriage does not impact the survivor benefit where in the divorce situation, you have to uh, be single. Okay, what happens if I made a mistake? Uh, we've had this happen. We've had uh, clients go ahead and uh, decide they're going to um, apply at age 62, and then they come and they meet with us and they go through a full retirement projection and they decide, wow, we really, we, we made a mistake we should have waited until full retirement age or, or age 70. Uh, is there any way to fix this? Well, as long as it's been less than a year, um, it can be fixed. Uh, you must be under the full retirement age 
and uh, you do have to pay all of the monies that you receive back, right, to the Social Security Administration. Um, this can only be a one-time uh, withdrawal during your lifetime, and you may have to amend tax returns depending on, you know, whether or not the timing for your return and, and when you actually pay these benefits um, back. But just so you know, there is there is a way if it's within a year to, to fix the situation. Um, you can also suspend. So you decide to start claiming your Social Security and then you think, wow, you know, I just got this great job and now, you know, I'm, I'm being taxed and, you know, maybe that wasn't such a great decision. I don't really need the money. Um, so you can suspend um, as long as you've um, reached the full retirement age, but less than 70 years old. Um, your benefits are going to be um, based on earnings record uh, would have been suspended, including spousal benefit. You need to pay back, you need to pay any Medicare Part B premiums uh, out of pocket because you won't have a Social Security check um, for those to be deducted from. Uh, and you begin to receive delayed retirement credits that will then increase your future Social Security benefit. Um, and lastly, you'd be ineligible for the supplementary security income if you decide to suspend. Okay, so we did pretty well. We've got uh, 20 minutes. We wanted to leave time for questions. These are a few questions we put up um, that came to us in advance, but we're also going to be uh, monitoring the chat box. So uh, first question, we got we got many of this. I think a lot of people are thinking uh, they may, they may want to leave uh, the United States of America and go live somewhere um, that's less expensive. Um, can I still receive Social Security benefits if I live abroad? Absolutely. The answer to that is yes. Um, where you live does not impact your ability to collect your Social Security benefits. Now, how you're taxed on those benefits, you know, if you're a United States citizen, even though you live abroad, you're still required to uh, file a uh, income tax return in the United States and declare your worldwide income, um, which would include the Social Security benefits received. But you know that's a whole nother thing. I'm the CPA. That's something that we also take into effect the tax aspects of these decisions. Um, and we have many people. There's there's expat communities in Mexico and um, uh, certainly down in um, the South Pacific where you know living costs are a lot less. And people are thinking about well, perhaps they might just uh, decide to retire abroad. Alex, you want to take All number right, two? So Absolutely happy, happy to do that. Uh, what is the impact of retiring but waiting to start collecting Social Security benefits? Would the estimated monthly income still still be the same? Uh, the answer is it depends, and it's, it's a very important it depends. The best way to address your question, as Judy mentioned earlier, is to go on www.ssa.gov and do two things, review your earnings record and make sure you're not missing any years. And also in the middle of the second page, in the middle of the second page of the four page social security report, um, it will tell you specifically if your projected benefit is based on you working longer or not. And that is very important. Usually for those of our clients who are you know, younger in their 50s and 60s, um, usually the answer is positive. If you continue to work, uh, your benefits will be what they're reporting to you. And if you stop working, it would most likely be something le something else. For those of our clients who are perhaps in their you know, late, six, late 60s and they already have enough years, meaning 35 years, perhaps uh, perhaps the maximum amount, the fact that they would continue to work or not would not impact their benefits because they're already at the max uh, with the exclusion of the inflation adjustment. So again, the short answer is review your social security statement. That is the best way to handle it. Uh, third question here, I have a government pension. Will that affect my social security benefit uh, benefits? Well, the answer is also actually it depends, meaning your social security benefit may be reduced. Again, the best way to check for that is to, if your government employees, to reach out to your to OPM actually or your HR department, or to look at your social security statement. On the bottom of the second page, on, on the right, it will talk about the uh, WEP, 
or windfall elimination provision. So if essentially you didn't pay into the social security system when you joined you know, federal government, there would be a reduction. For many of our clients, that is not the case, especially for those who are under FERS, which is the new system, but that is absolutely the case for most of those who are still, there's very few who are under CSRS. So that's, that's how you would check for that. Maybe the right, yes, so the, the windfall elimination provision, there's also the government pension offset. So those are two reductions that could apply to you um, where your Social Security might be reduced. But Alex is right, you know, check it, check your statement online. Um, and if you have that specific situation, um, we'd, be, we'd be happy to help. Uh, with regard to the last question, can I still file and suspend Social Security benefits and request a lump sum payment? And that's what I uh, mentioned before, um, the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015 um, eliminated the file and suspend rule. Um, one question that came through, um, my business is a property rental and my income has been mostly capital gains. So Social Security will only pay me a small amount when I retire. Does it make sense to incorporate and pay myself income um, when it will mean being taxed twice? So um, I'll just reiterate what we had talked about in the beginning of the session is that it must be earned income. You, you, you have to be paying into the Social Security system in order to be getting those credits that we talked about, the 10 years of credits that you need. And then of course the earnings history that the benefit is based on is going to be picking up your uh, Social Security earnings. So, um, you know, in this particular example, yes, to the extent that you um, change to pay yourself so that you are paying into Social Security, that would be um, potentially uh, increasing depending obviously on, on the amounts, the amount of Social Security benefits that you would receive um, at retirement. Alex, did All you right. have one to add? Uh, so in terms of the questions, I'm just trying to decide which way we should go. Uh, we have, again, many that we can cover from, from those that were submitted to us prior to this webinar, but I'm also looking at the chat box here, and there are some coming from the chat box. So we can alternate. We do have essentially 13 minutes. We can take one from, from the submitted questions and then take one from the chat box. Does that sound okay. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> yep. Okay. So uh, this, this, some of it may be repetitive. I'll just, um, I'll just basically read them out loud. Um, I am 81 and also receive social security benefits. Will I get added social security after her death? The answer to that question is if your wife's benefit is higher than your own, then you would inherit her benefit. If your benefit is higher, well then of course, it doesn't make sense for you to inherit her benefit. You can only receive one benefit at any time. You cannot receive both. Judy, are there any that you would like to take from the chat box? Um, well, I'm just saying one from one that was submitted earlier. Um, what are your feelings of suspending benefits until age 70 during these unusual times? And that actually just brought up um, an article that I was reading about how will the current pandemic actually impact the Social Security Trust Fund? Um, on the one hand, sadly, I think we reached 400,000 deaths at the end of yesterday. Um, many of those um, deaths are to seniors, which means that their Social Security payments will, will stop, although there will be survivor benefits that could kick in. Um, but there's also a lot less people paying in to the Social Security system because of the high levels of unemployment. So time will tell, actually to determine how much of an impact the pandemic is having actually on the health, overall health of the social security. Um, and again, I think that, uh, and I usually we don't approach too much on politics here, but um, you know, in the next 14 years, as unpopular as it is, the uh, situation has to be addressed by Congress. Um, and I'm, thinking that probably it'll be a topic within the presidential election four years from now, uh, unless they're all too scared to talk about it, and in which case it'll be eight years from now. But frankly, the sooner that they address it, you know, the sooner that hopefully it can be shored up and people can feel comfortable 
about waiting until age 70 for that higher benefit, where uh, otherwise they may be thinking, well, if I'm only going to get 79% of my payment um, because the funds, you know, is running out of money, then I better file now and get what I can get. So we do hear that. We do hear those, uh, those discussions. Alex? Right. So uh, I guess, uh, yes, I will also uh, um, take one from, from, from those that were submitted to us. And this is actually a relatively common one. If my plan is to work until I'm 70, should I plan to file for benefits at 66? Uh, the answer is negative, no. You know, and this is actually, perhaps we'll cover one of the questions from the chat box. How long before age 71, before age 70 must one apply? Um, you know, three months is our normal recommendation. Uh, given, you know, what's happening with coronavirus, of course, everything is delayed. Feel free to do it four months ahead of time. But again, if you're planning to collect at the age of 70, you certainly do not need to apply at age 66. Uh, you see, one of the mistakes, that, not necessarily trying to jump around here, but it's, it's a mistake, is when people apply for Medicare at the age of 65, or to be specific, three months prior to their age 65, and somehow, some way, they assume that they need to begin their social security benefits at the same time. And that is what Judy covered earlier. That is not the case. The two are part of the same program, actually, but you do not have to collect um, those types of benefits in, in, at the same time. In fact, it is quite common for those people who are working to stay in their employer's plan because they like it, or perhaps it's heavily subsidized and not go on part B, which is what you're actually paying for, but still collect, begin collecting your social security benefits, let's say at the age of 67, because you just don't want to wait until your age 70. So, Judy? Right, and just to add on to that question about um, how much long time, um, they, the Social Security Administration will pay you back benefits. Um, but like everything, um, a lot of times the bureaucracies are taking longer to, you know, get checks out to, um, you know, to process all of the applications. So um, I, I agree with Alex, you know, the sooner to go ahead and get on uh, Social Security, the better um, in terms of the application process. And if it's delayed, then, you know, as you say, they will pay you the back payments, but, you know, give it a little bit more time given so many people working from home and things perhaps maybe not being quite as timely as they have been in the past. Right. Um, I started to contribute in social security at age 43. What is my chances of earning social security benefit? And if not, how I could recover? Um, well, so if you've got 10 years in um, of credits, then you would be part of Social Security. You want to create that My Account and go back and look at your earnings history, and it will also tell you what your expected benefit would be. Um, obviously, um, when I explained the 35 years uh, and the inflation-adjusted earnings, the, the, the higher that you earn, um, most people, their earnings go up. Um, during their, you know, their their career, and so uh, waiting and earning more, um, unless you're over the 35 years, would uh, would help to increase the amount of benefit that you would qualify for. Right, Alex. Uh, one of the, I guess it's a follow-up question here. Uh, spousal benefits from from the higher earner is not automatic. So I'm actually <laughs> not sure what exactly that question is asking. But I always recommend that if your spouse dies and you expect to receive his or her benefit because it's higher, that you contact them. That is the best way to deal with it. Yes, there is a possibility that you're going to be waiting. You know, they'll, they'll actually give you a call back. Oh, by the way, that's that's one of the features they have. When you call them and the wait time is very long, you'll just leave your name and your phone number and they'll give you a call back in, you know, in an hour or so. But I would always confirm on all of, on all of those things because it is a very large bureaucracy. And I mean it in the best possible way. You always want to double check on those things. Uh, Alex, here's one. Um, asked earlier but didn't see a response. If my spouse is the higher earner and is retirement age but is not collecting benefits and dies before they start collecting, 
and the surviving spouse still collect their benefits versus their own lower benefits. So that would be to apply for the survivor as a widower benefits. So the answer to that would be yes. Correct. I was trying to go back through the chat box here. That's, that is correct, yes. Um, All right. Any other questions you see? Well, one of the questions, um, is there a way to access my history of tax payments back to the early 1980s for purposes of checking my social security accuracy? Uh, I do not have records that old. So again, the starting point would be to go on um, www.ssa.gov and to look at your um, actual earnings record. It would be on the, on the top of page three. And if you've seen any years when it's essentially zero, um, then you would want to address those years. Yeah, and the earnings record, that's what I referred to in the beginning. Um, and I happened to pull mine out uh, yesterday and was looking over it. It has from when I started working, you know, as a teenager. I mean, it, it, it has everything. It shows years where there's no earnings. Um, and then, you know, every year it shows what the Social Security maximum is. Uh, and then what your actual earnings were. Of course, you're only going to get credit for the, you know, the Social Security maximum, but um, uh, it does lay it all out there. And there are have been situations where, in fact, there have been miss, missing uh, earnings, and that takes a while, certainly, to get corrected um, with the Social Security Administration. So uh, do check it out um, and make sure that it's that it's right. Don't wait until you plan on um, actually retiring all right so should we take one more question yeah Judy? i think about one more that would be good perfect that's 1156 so we'll take it up from the chat box um, if i've maxed out but continue to work part-time at a lower income will my benefit decrease so if i understand your question correctly when you're saying you maxed out to me that means that you work for 35 years and your earnings in each of those 35 years were at the max to receive the maximum possible social security benefit. If that is the case, then whatever you're earning after those 35 years will not increase your benefit. What is also important, every so often we have a situation when someone says, okay, I have 33 years of earnings at the max, and I'm considering two more years um, of work to increase my social security benefits. Well, that is great, but the, the, the actual increase for those two additional years will be somewhat insignificant. One of the mistakes, and I'm now I'm taking a slightly different direction here, that some federal employees make, they assume that their social security benefit is based on their high three, highest three years of earnings. That is not the case. That is how FERS works. For social security, it's based on your 35 years of earnings. So uh, for, for this particular person, again, I hope I'm ask, uh, answering your question, uh, but it's, it's unlikely based on how you're uh, asking your question. Okay, uh, we wanted to point out we have upcoming events. Um, uh, on January 26th, we will be uh, presenting the new Paycheck Protection Program. We call it PPP2, not Alex and myself, but CBM will be um, having a presentation on that. And then on February 3rd, uh, market, uh, Alex and Debbie May will be doing their market update, um, which they present now every two months. Um, and they'll be covering just uh, you know, financial considerations for the new year. Um, Alex and I will be presenting how to choose a financial advisor on February 9th. And on February 23rd, we will be discussing Medicare and Medicaid. We'll have a guest speaker uh, on Medicaid planning, an attorney. Um, that's going to be joining us um, and everything you need to know about uh, Medicare and Medicaid on that date. Um, so with that, um, oh, and our CBM does have a coronavirus um, COVID-19 resource center on our website if there are any questions about that that could help you. So uh, we are very happy to have been spent the last hour with you. Um, we thank you for uh, all of the questions and hope that you um, learned a lot. Uh, on this slide, you'll see how to reach myself, Judy Barnhart and Alex, 
happy to help in, in whatever way we can. Thank you for attending. Thank you very much, everyone.